here, gang. This is a weird one. It's genuinely rare. I've never come across one of these. This is a Gibson Les Paul Jumbo Acoustic. You don't hear about this one because they didn't make very many. Nobody wanted it. Nobody bought it. And the number in existence is very, very small. In 1968, Gibson and Les Paul got back together and figured that they could make money again. So they reissued the old Les Paul solid body designs after a seven or eight year hiatus because they'd grown in popularity as rock and roll sort of shifted over and became rock. You had Mike Bloomfield playing one, Keith Richards, Jeff Beck, a bunch of people had started playing them and they were getting sought after. So along with those, Les wanted them to build some guitars for him around ideas that he'd been working on involving low impedance signal chains. Les is, of course, a studio pioneer, a sonic revolutionary. So they came out with, like, the Les Paul Personal, there was the Professional, and a couple of years later they did the Recording Model. And these are pretty fancy. These were all built around the low impedance pickup and some specialized frequency filters like the Decade knob, which is on this guitar, which passes the signal through a bunch of different caps and resistors um, to accentuate various highs and lows. So it's like a tone knob with a series of preset points on it. None of those guitars sold in very big numbers, but along with them came this thing. They wanted to put his name on an acoustic. Apparently the J160 from earlier in the decade, the one that became known as a Beatle guitar. That one was supposed to have been a Les Paul, but he didn't like it, so they just released it as is. In 1969, he relented. He said, okay, you can put my name on, but it's got to have one of my pickups on it. So we get this thing, which is, it's like a dreadnought Frankenstein. It's bizarre. This thing is a real beast. It's super heavy, and it's more akin, in my mind, to like a semi-hollow body guitar, because it's got supporting plywood panels in there, as well as the regular bracing, almost as if they wanted to kill the acoustic response. And of course, the sound hole has been shifted down to make way for the big pickup there, uh, taking up prime acoustic space. So, sonically, it's kind of subdued if you play it unplugged. Um, if you want to plug it in, you need a special patch cord. I think the professional uh, model, Les Paul, uses a, like a regular microphone XLR jack. This one has its own special patch cord. It's nicely made for the period. Back and sides here are laminated Brazilian rosewood. And it's got an ornate center stripe there. The top is Sitka spruce kind of unremarkable. It's got a nicely matched three-piece mahogany neck and some kind of fancy tuners. I believe these are early sealed shalers. So how many did they make? We don't have numbers for the first year, unfortunately, due to Gibson's much vaunted record keeping systems, but they made 43 in 1971, three in 1972, and another three in 73. So what's that? 52 plus the first year's production which is probably another 50, so probably around 100 of these things in total. In this instance, any value it has comes from rarity rather than endorsements, because I don't think I've seen any professional musician ever with one of these in their hand. Les, of course, was trying to get any distortion out of his signal chain. He wanted it cleaner than clean, and I sometimes wonder if he was really going for something more like a synthesizer tone. Of course, at that time in the late 60s, people playing electric guitar were doing a complete 180 and really trying to overdrive their amps and get super dirty. So he was at odds. Um, jazz guitarists could maybe appreciate it more, but they, a lot of them, also have kind of a conservative view about what the equipment should be. They've already got an L5 or ES-175, you know, that's, that's pretty much it for them. They don't need anything else. This was like, I'm not spending $650 on that. This thing needs a neck reset. The action isn't too bad, really, but the bridge has been cut down to the point where you can't lower the adjustable saddle any farther, and there simply isn't enough down pressure from the strings. They're, it's very anemic sounding, kind of clicky and buzzy. And the owner wants to replace the bridge with something full height and to do the neck reset. So we can see what this thing actually sounds like in its best configuration. Also, he says there may be something um, going on with one of the tone controls. So this should prove interesting.
I plugged it in to get a quick sound test and forgot that I actually need the specialized cable here. This looks like just a standard XLR adapter. So the volume works. Up next is the decade knob, which is that multi-tone selector. Pretty subtle. It's probably the kind of thing that you'd find the two that you like and never touch the rest. So there's a treble knob, and a bass knob. Just don't seem to be doing much, but there is this selector switch here. It's a two way switch that bypasses these. is actually working like a volume. Quick shot of the inside with the electronics. This is heavily ladder braced and you can see a couple of the plywood reinforcement plates. The one in the center there is about eight inches square and I'm guessing it's about a quarter of an inch thick. I'll unscrew the saddle. This is the characteristic Gibson adjustable feature with the nuts embedded in the soundboard. I mark the front side there. Then I'll heat up and remove the bridge. This came off without too much fuss and it's pretty clean. There's Brazilian rosewood on the back and sides, but this bridge is definitely Indian. It's got a very distinctive fragrance, which is quite different from Brazilian rosewood. So that's what I'm going to use. Here I'm marking out the outline. I'll drill the bridge pin holes and then use my oscillating spindle sander to create the profile. It's possible to carve one of these by hand, but it never has the same character because these are really designed around the curves formed by a sanding drum. Same with the thinning of the wings. This is rough and tumble woodwork. It does get refined by hand though. The saddle slot in these is inconveniently slightly more than a quarter inch wide, so I'll have to make two passes with the router to get a proper fit for the saddle, as it's pretty snug in there. It's about 20 thousandths or half a millimeter oversize. I set up and make the first cut, and then to shift the jig an accurate distance, I'll use a slip of 20 thousandths veneer here between the back of the jig and a block of plywood which I'll super glue in place on the work surface. Then I can take out the veneer and move the routing platform so it's hard up against the plywood. It's the most accurate method I've figured out to do this if you don't have some kind of fancy micrometer driven jig. And I'll take the second cut. That fits nicely. They're practically twins except for height. I have to clean off the old glue from the soundboard. With self-adhesive sandpaper in place I'll shape the underside of the bridge. This was quick this time because there's very little arch in this soundboard. It's basically built flat. Then I glued it in place. I had to use some odd clamps this time because the sound hole is in a very different place from where it usually is. That glued on nicely. Looking at the saddle, however, you can see how floppy it is between the capture points on the screws. And that's because it was cut way down to try and lower the action. It would still function this way but the tops of the screws then protrude a lot higher above the bridge than they should and it just it looks funny. So I need to glue a piece of rosewood onto the bottom of this thing to re-establish the height. Here's why we save all the small scraps of rosewood. The grain in this one is running off at a diagonal so sharply that it's not useful for very many things but if I cut it like this it'll be just fine for this purpose. Every once in a while you'll cut into a piece of rosewood and immediately ask yourself whether this tree might have been growing right beside the water buffalo pens. <coughs> Stinky. So 
So I'll glue this riser to the underside of the saddle and trim that back to fit so it's the proper width. I need to drill holes in the ends and I left the riser slightly longer so that I could drill all the way through and have a clean hole then cut back afterwards. Now I just have to plane it to the proper height. We'll check the plane of the frets against the bridge. In this case we want the line to fall slightly above the top surface so we'll get decent break angle for the strings and we are quite a bit below that. The fingerboard extension on this guitar is pretty thin and it looks to me like there's lacquer or something dark, so like glue maybe. I'm not sure if it'll focus. You can see right there in the corner. There is a crack in the lacquer around most of the heel surfaces, which is a good thing. These can be a bit of a bear to remove, these late 60s Gibson necks. Sometimes, depending on how well the parts fit, they could stuff filler in the joint, sometimes glue. On this guitar and another example of the Les Paul Jumbo I saw online, there's this characteristic burst effect. It's very subtle. It's on the headstock and the heel here. This is something Gibson did when the fits got a little messy and they wanted to disguise it. They'd spray on some brown lacquer, just in these areas. Nothing else on the guitar is sunbursted, just the heel. I'll remove the pickup from its place so I can get at the fingerboard extension. This is a heavy unit. It's fully potted in epoxy and the magnet is very powerful. It's the kind of thing that won't fit through its own hole without taking out of the mounting ring. It would have been nice if I could just shove it back down into the guitar. That wasn't going to happen until I took off the ring. Even then it was a bit of a jigsaw puzzle. And the lead wires are quite short, so it's not like you've got a whole lot of room to play around. There it goes. I'll fix it somewhere inside the guitar so it's not going to bang around when I'm doing all of the neck resetting jazz. Well, it's good and hot, but this stuff is rubbery in a way that recalls epoxy. It does not like separating. A little unusual. It was under a lot of tension. It's time to remove the 15th fret as that falls over the end of the dovetail. I've scored along either side of it just using my fret removing pliers here. Then I'll drill a couple of holes. There's been another recent development in the evolution of neck removal. This one comes to us from Doc Rathwell at Fretted Revival in Montreal. It's a good shop. They're not on YouTube. You can check them out on Instagram. That's where I saw a picture that made me stop at my tracks and go, Why? What is that? That's new. I've never seen that before. What is going on there? And I think Ian Davlin had the same response as he promptly got Doc on his Ian Hates Guitars Patreon for an interview to find out what the deal was. Um, Ian, of course, was the one who came up with the heat stick which uh, Stumac has been uh, promoting for a while now. Doc saw some ready-made available technology that does the thing that Ian designed independently. The goal is of course to remove necks without steam and through a hole that can be covered by the width of a fret. So like less than 80 thousandths or 2 millimeters. So the resistance heater, which is basically a stainless tube with a shielded nichrome wire running inside it, and contacting the stainless in one spot is also a thing used in the foam industry for shaping blocks of foam. Model makers use it, upholstery people, people who make Muppets. Doc has been dealing with a company in the US called Hotwire Foam Factory. They sell professional grade hot wires, which they also call hot knives. Get your jokes out. 
As it turns out, there's really, really inexpensive Chinese versions available on Amazon, too. I wasn't sure I wanted to trust a $12 version, especially after I saw this. Widely use, etc., etc., and so forth. This hot pen will take you to a magical kingdom. Well, what if I don't want to go? What if I want to just stay here, hot pen? Don't try and remove me. You're not my real dad. Yeah, I guess I should also make a disclaimer. You guys realize that when I do something like this, obviously we're using a product for a purpose it was never intended for. There's liabilities, there's risk. You know, I have some experience in popping the necks off of things using both heat and electricity. Don't consider this a how-to. Don't burn down your shop or your guitar or hurt yourself. Um, you're just following along for the ride on this, okay? I'm not responsible if you try this and something goes terribly wrong. Wouldn't you know what? I think my thermal couple on my multimeter is crapping out on me. It's not being very stable, but I think we're somewhere around 130 degrees Celsius. These things heat up very quickly. It's been 10 minutes. Things seem to be loosening up nicely. Oh man, as soon as I put the camera down, it popped. You guys would have loved it too. It was a very satisfying pop. It was like... Okay, hey, we'll have a look at it here. Yeah, it came out pretty clean. This does run hotter than the uh, ones I've previously been making myself. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. There's a little bit more scorching on the inside, but... Well, I'm pretty happy with that. One thing to be mindful when taking the necks off guitars with a cutaway, I've had this happen on a couple of occasions using steam, sometimes you can get this area wet and hot enough that it will separate slightly from the neck block. You have to re-adhere that before you go any farther. In this case we seem to be fine. Uh, there is one small section of side here which is missing, which is adhered to the front edge of the heel, so we'll have to replace that. But other than that, yep, worked well. Happy with that. We'll take a sec to acknowledge the gray putty fill used to close up some gaps after assembly. Because it's up at the top there, I will probably end up having to redo this because taking material from the bottom of the heel won't close this gap. I'll salvage that little piece of side veneer, which is legitimately glued in place. Take some prying to get off and re-glue that back in its spot. I'll do a little bit of undercutting near the bottom of the heel where most of the wood has to be removed. The way I learned this whole neck reset thing was kind of second hand. There was a VHS tape that Stumac put out in the 90s where Dan took a trip to the west coast and he visited a whole bunch of luthiers and repair people. Um, I think that's where he met Frank Ford. Um, Santa Cruz was on the list, a bunch of other guys, and he went to Jeff Trogett's shop. I think Richard Hoover was involved in the conversation too. And there was a verbal description, more than anything, where he showed some of the tools he used and described what he did. And Dan seemed like very interested or impressed at the time. But Jeff was the one who said, this is very important. Brush the dust off between each pull. It's um, the way to keep things neat. I've seen guitars where it obviously wasn't a priority and it looks like someone has basically sanded along each side of the neck. Gibson necks can take a bit longer because the heel is so wide and there's more wood to remove. It isn't like a quick process. You've got to count the strokes, keep them equal on both sides. You've got to check and see that material is, you know, sometimes material needs to come off the center of the heel because at a certain point um, you're removing the stuff on the sides but there's a bump left in the center you have to take down. 
because it feels like you're not getting anywhere. Um, and you got to make sure you're equalizing the pressure and not favoring one side because that could tip the neck in one direction or the other, which is sometimes necessary if the uh, string path isn't you know, directed properly at the bridge. And of course you need to you know, keep an eye on the angle because you want to sneak up on it. It's just, there's a whole lot going on in every axis in this job. I use 120 grit. I know there's some people who use slightly more aggressive abrasives. I just find that sometimes, depending on the guitar, you can get, like, it'll want to, like, if I was using 80 or 60 grit, sometimes it wants to pop the lacquer off because the abrasive there is so large, it's almost like little stones that sort of, they chip things like a, a car finish almost. After a whole bunch of sanding, we'll get some glue on it and clamp it together. I used some padded blocks on the fingerboard and on the area just under the heel against the interior neck block in there. So I'm not in danger of breaking the sides or anything. Because of the angle change of the neck, I need to make a wedge to go under the fingerboard and bring it closer to level. I'm measuring with feeler gauges here. I'll glue that in place. Recently I've been gluing the wedge in a separate operation from the dovetail. I think I get a better fit this way. Then I'll reinstall the 15th fret. I'll have a look at the electronics. This will basically be a cleaning operation to see if there's something shorting out or gunking up the base tone pot. The owner said not to worry too much about it because I guess it's not the kind of thing that gets put into regular use. Here's the harness. 137 is a CTS code and it was made in the 16th week of 1970. So I'll spray some contact cleaner in these pots and that'll flush out a whole lot of gunk. Gross. Work it back and forth to get the wipers inside clean. I inspected everything Refloat some solder joints that look like they might be a bit cold. We're going to keep the caps and resistors original um, as everything else is functioning pretty well at this point. I mean, you'd be in a real pickle if you messed up that decade knob. I'm not sure how easy those are to come by these days. So everything's got to go back in, which you can imagine is a joy. Peekaboo! And these guys no washers on these, just um, the nuts themselves have a little um, protuberance that goes down below the surface of the soundboard. Another case where the alligator clip helps contain the spring while the screw gets introduced to its hole. It's really no fun getting these heavy springs to stay in place when you only have half an inch of wiggle room in the lead wire. Here I'll dress and recrown the odd little bumps that happen in the upper reaches anytime you take the neck off. I'm going to go with some SIT 11 to 50s with the wound G this time. Hopefully that's heavy enough to get us some decent acoustic tone. These tuners have split shafts, which I think are kind of unusual for Gibson. Set up. I still have a little bit of touch up to do on the lacquer where the neck meets the body on both sides. I need to replace the bit of filler that was in there up near the top. And just sort of soften the line with some finish. I'll do that tomorrow night when I'm finishing other jobs. I'm trying to keep exposure to the toxins as under control as I can by doing all the finishing tasks at the same time, so I'm not constantly bathing in the fumes. The sound has not really changed a whole lot from previously, uh, though the top two strings now are much more focused because they have some break angle on them. This is set up very low, as that's what the player wants. 
the action is four sixty-fourths on the bass and a little over three on the treble, so electric action. It's about 20% lower than I normally would set up a dreadnought. I'll play it a little bit unamplified, but I don't think it should be thought of as an acoustic guitar at all. This is a hollow body electric disguised as a dreadnought. And it's an odd mashup. I'm not sure it really succeeds in being either of those things, but it is an interesting historical footnote in the Gibson catalog. Uh, I don't think they'll rush to reissue this one which, oddly enough, makes it pretty valuable.